Welcome, everyone. My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. Welcome to the virtual YIVO. Um, we're so pleased uh, to be with you all um, this afternoon. Um, today, we're celebrating Sutzgiver Essential Prose, a new book of translations by Zachary Scholenberger. Today's event is uh, co-sponsored by the Yiddish Book Center, and it's a part of Carnegie Hall's Voices of Hope, Artists in Times of Oppression Festival. So for those that don't know about YIVO, we're a really special place for the contemplation and the celebration of Jewish history and Jewish culture. We have a library and an archive with over 400,000 books and over 23 million documents. And these books and documents are used by researchers from around the world. And in addition to making these materials available, we also have a variety of activities that bring to life uh, the stories and the culture that is found in them. So we have exhibitions, we have a variety of classes, both in Jewish history and culture and also in the Yiddish language. So if you're really excited after learning about Sutzgiver today and you want to learn Yiddish so you can read the originals, you can come to YIVO and study with us. And finally, we have public programs like the one that we're, have, we're in right now. Lectures, discussions, con uh, concerts, conferences, symposia, um, all sorts of things to try to bring the riches um, and all the wonderful research that's done at YIVO uh, to, the, to audiences like yourselves. So thank you all very much for joining us. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Justin Cammy, who is going to moderate today's event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. And uh, Shalom Aleichem. Welcome to everyone from around the world to this special event, uh, a discussion of Avram Sutzkever's Essential Prose, a publication of the White Goat Press by the Yiddish Book Center and translated by Zachary Shalom Berger. I'm Justin Cammy, a chair of the program in Jewish studies at Smith College in Massachusetts. And I'm so delighted to join with Yivo and my distinguished panelists and those of you tuning in uh, for this afternoon's discussion. Unfortunately, our colleague, Dr. Miriam Treen fell ill and won't be able to join us today, but I and the remaining guests are eager to join in discussion of this volume. So uh, we will leave time at the end also for your written questions, which we encourage you to put in the chat. So first, let me introduce our two panelists. Zachary Schellenberger is translator of Sutzkever's Essential Prose. He's also a poet and a physician. Uh, his work has appeared in Poetry Magazine, in the Yiddish Forward, and uh, several other really impressive publications. His verse ranges from the philosophical and the medical to the immediate problems of his adopted city of Baltimore, where he is a key, I would say, even beloved figure in its Yiddish-speaking Chavruz. Uh, Karolina Shimanyak is Assistant Professor of Jewish Studies at the department uh, in, in, at the University of um, Wrocław in Poland and Research Fellow at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. Her research interests range across modern Jew Yiddish literature, Polish-Jewish cultural relations, translation studies, and in addition to having taught Yiddish language and culture throughout Poland and Europe, and I would say even um, to my own students, uh, she has also served as a consultant on the Polin Museum and the Museum of Modern Art in Łódź. Her recent publications include Montage, Deborah Vogel and the New Legend of the City, and My Wild Goat, an anthology of women Yiddish poets, and that's in Polish. She's also the editor of Rachel Auerbach's Ghetto Writings, and really a dynamic force for Yiddish, not only in Poland, but um, really throughout the whole world. So I, I should really begin by saying that in my role as moderator, I might um, jump in a little bit more than normal given Miriam's absence, but I want to make sure that the primary voices are those of Zachary and Carolina. Uh, but I wanna begin by noting that we are at a very exciting moment of translation for Yiddish in general, and perhaps no writer has been featured more of late than Sutzkever. We have just in the past few years, two translated volumes of his verse into English by Heather Valencia and Richard Fine, a brand new volume of poetry and verse and uh, prose in French by Rachel Ertel, two documentary films, one produced in Israel, another here in the United States. And now, uh, finally, Sutzkever's Essential Prose by Zachary, Shul by Zachary Berger, which brings for the first time in a collected work, uh, most of his uh, fictions, uh, that he produced over a period of uh, a number of decades. I'll also announce um, that in the fall, I will be coming out with a translation of his prose memoir, 
along with some reminiscences. So we have in this one year, really an opportunity to consider um, Sutzkover as a prose writer. But of course, many of you may know that Sutzkover for uh, most of his career uh, was known primarily as a poet, first in Vilna, then in the Vilna ghetto, and thereafter in the new state of Israel. Uh, someone whose faith in the powers of the Yiddish word were expressed from his earliest days in verse. Less known are his fictions, uh, which he begins publishing in the early to mid 1950s, first in Greener Aquarium, Green Aquarium, which appears as the last section of a, uh, other, of a volume known as Ode to the Dove. It's a hybrid volume of both poetry and prose then picks up on that again in the early 70s, publishing stories in Messiah's Diary, and uh, finally publishing There Where the Stars Sp Spend the Night in 1979, which is combined in the 80s with other stories known as the Prophecy of the Inner Eye. And of course, throughout all of this, he is publishing these fictions in the journal that he edited for decades, known as The Golden Kate. And he told Heather Valencia, one of his translators, that, quote, these stories are myself. So really, uh, maybe the first question uh, to Zachary, perhaps you could start us off with just a few words about your interest in this project, some of the challenges you encountered, and maybe if you'd indulge us a few, you know, uh, some short lines of your own translation of Sutzkever's prose. Sure, and it's a great pleasure to be here under the auspices of the YIVO and the Yiddish Book Center and with my distinguished panelists who are themselves are experts in Sutzkever. And I want to say as a translator, without the collaboration and the good works of the people at the Book Center and of Sutzkever scholars in many places, this, this work would not have come to fruition. Um, there are several questions that really engage me about Sutzkever's prose poetry or fictions and um, I'm going to read in a bit a very short selection to hopefully spark a discussion and a consideration of those questions. One is, what's the relationship between Sutzkever's lyric poetry? Because that does form the bulk of his creative work. That was his, that was, I think, his predominant self-representation um, and, and understanding of his own role in the world as a, a lyric poet. And I, I would make so bold as to say a, of a, of a neo-prophetic nature. And what's the relation between the prose poetry and the lyric poetry, both in terms of style, in terms of vocabulary, and in terms of recurrent motifs? Um, the, the Yiddish scholar David Volpe compared Sutzkever's work to a spiral, which circles um, constantly or continuously around uh, recurrent themes. So I think the prose poetry does that in relation to the lyric poetry. Next is, how do we understand the work as, as part of the genre of the Holocaust literature, which I think has, has something to recommend it as a descriptive category and some limitations. And, la and lastly, what are the challenges confronting any translator, but also a translator from the Yiddish and a translator from the Yiddish of, of prose poetry, which sits easily or uneasily on the boundary of multiple genres. So as a way of considering those questions, I'd like to read a, a very short piece, short in the interest of time, uh, from, from the volume, which I'm going to hold up here to show everyone with the miraculous cover. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a short piece called The Vision Over the, the River. And as I read it, I want the, those participating and, and joining us on the Zoom to consider several questions. One is, what does this make you think of in terms of literary influences, in terms of making you think of things you have read or seen elsewhere? How does this relate to your conceptions as of Holocaust literature as a genre? And, and finally, and I think this is a good way to approach any piece, any fiction, what's going on, what's, what's happening? We're not gonna maybe have time for, all, for, for that, for a, an analysis of the story here, but it helps us orient ourselves in the world of these prose poetry pieces. So the vision over the river. I saw a vision over my hometown's river decades after the incident. The spring that was raging over the barely breathing earth wasn't like any spring that had ever sprung. At the start of a day, it snorts with its dark searching nostrils, blowing over the layer of ice covering the river and the tangled ice is sharpened down to a glowing blue shattered mirror. The raging spring sees then very clearly that it is not like its face. So there's a thundering and a clanging in the river and a black fire of rolling waters leaps out from its caverns. As in a dream of white bears shot from the sky, ice flows are tumbling flows over flows 
The black fire of flow-choked waters is now over the shores towards the nearby villages. Cocks are crowing now in those nearby villages. They are crowing to their angel, the soul star. Lords are waiting in their huts like leeches full of blood. Their axes rest above them on the arboreal walls and the finger of sunrise extracts their last drops. Gallop of flow choked waters devouring the huts outward and inside. Only the roosters are innocently torn from the earth and they hang there in midair gravitating toward their angel. When the flows retreat from the battlefield, they stay a while in a grove of fir trees, not far from the former huts. There, they spade out of the yellow earth, a frozen wedding with bride, groom, and musicians. From the fir grove, a band with a glass of red wine is also excavated. The flows lift the wedding onto their shoulders and float off with the domain of the rushing stream. A chupa is woven with threads of sunlight over the river. The bride smiles behind her veil like the first leaf of spring from the veiled earth. But who are the musicians playing for? And again, that's the vision over the river, um, first published in 1977. So Carolina, maybe you'd like to, you don't necessarily need to answer uh, Zachary's questions on this, but perhaps jump in with your own initial impressions of Sutzkever as a prose writer uh, and maybe place him within uh, a larger scope of either his period or of Yiddish fiction writing. Welcome. Um, well, I'm actually tempted to hear uh, Zachary's answers, what he was thinking of, what influences had he in mind mm -hmm. when he was translating this uh, piece and other prose pieces, because I mean, this is something also that I think we'll be talking about in as a translator's, I mean, task also, how do you recreate what you feel in the Yiddish for the English audience? I certainly cannot feel everything when while listening to English, but I do feel a lot while listening to the Yiddish part. Actually, I would like to start by, I mean, challenging this, uh, I don't know, division between poetry and prose that I think Suskever himself is challenging. I mean, first, we, the first, uh, prose poetry that he publishes in a volume it are published in a poetry volume and then before the next volume comes he's uh, uh, republishing these texts in a poetic work in his collected poetic work, um, po poems so um, why do we need these division I think what Suskever does in, through this through okay let's call it tentatively prose for a while is to challenge these divisions, to do something to the uh, to our conventional understanding of what prose is and conventional expectations of prose and of, uh, yeah, that's what Zachary mentioned. I mean, this is um, uh, of the Holocaust literature as such. And um, and I think this is very important to, 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 to bear in mind that he uh, really, this, this, his writing poses a challenge to our conventional understanding of these, uh, these I mean, of, of, of the genres and, um, and of what Holocaust literature uh, can be, actually. Uh, so let's start with the genre. And it also takes us back to his interests. I mean, his, I mean, literary influences, perhaps, or inspirations are simply the, the authors he, he liked to read. Uh, I don't like the, the, the word influence actually, because it takes us, I mean, the, the relation is then um, unclear and Suskever is certainly a very creative power and what he does to the word, to the language and how he uh, masters it is, uh, is very powerful. And to speak about influences is something I think uh, inappropriate in his case. Uh, so first of all is like the, the I mean, some, some authors challenge uh, the romantic inspirations in his, uh, uh, in his uh, works. Yeah, if romanticism is understand, understood conventionally, but actually it's the romantic impulse that really want, I mean, drives him to, to challenge the, the genre divisions. That's where it comes from. So if you think about the history of the genre, uh, poem en prose, uh, so prose poetry, so that 
it takes us back to the 19th century and to the authors Sutskever was reading. And um, so that's one thing. So, and actually the romantic impulse there is just to challenge the boundaries the, and the genre classifications. That's something that Sutskever escapes, I think, in his writing. And while I was thinking, I mean, and also, I mean, the romanticism comes back also in his very um, text, the very text, the very prose. Okay, let's stick to the prose. I won't escape. I mean, that's how it shows us that our language is not enough to speak about Sutskever. Um, so he's, uh, uh, let's take Janina and the animal. I think that's the new translation that Zachary proposes that we, we also know it as Janina and the beast. Uh, for those of you who do not know yet the the exquisite translation, and I will show it again. <laughs> I think we <laughs> showing it again and again. I guess, I guess. So there, for example, I mean, the discussion, and that, that's what is very characteristic for Sutskever, like the metapoetical discussions that are embedded in his prose uh, in, in, and in his poetry. That's, that's something that, that, that is super important to understand. And when he's talking about a story of a girl, of a little child that was rescued by a, a Polish noblewoman, Janina. Actually, well, he starts, and it's, I mean, there are two openings to this story. One opening is, it's very interesting. Um, it, it is a, a kind of a letter to, to, to Janina, to the Polish woman, a letter that he was afraid to, to write because he didn't have the language and the address. And this is a thread, this is an image, this is a, uh, topic that Sutskever comes back later to in his uh, poems in the night and even as late as in the 1990s in his uh, poem about uh, letters without addresses. So this shows you what Zachary just mentioned, how, I mean, that this is a dense network of texts uh, that have recurrent motifs, but also simply that this is a kind of like a, a constellation of poetical imagination that that moves these texts and these motifs um, come back here and they're not only in the prose but we will see I mean these, this this prose is very rhythmic so and specific images specific symbols come back again and again and again but also in his poetry so this is the first opening and the second opening is a discussion about uh, um, romantic poetry and music and Chopin and different forms and he says that uh, like these tiny little forms, not the big uh, romantic uh, pathetic forms are, are better, are, are better carved. And the, 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 the sense of like the, car the work, the forging the work, carving the work is very important uh, here. So that's why I would take, uh, so place this uh, suits cover in this long line of experiments in prose dating back to the 19th century. And to the two, um, Please stop me when I speak too much because I mean it's such a vast topic. You totally like you know the canvas <laughs> here great, can be very different. Um, two uh, Polish uh, authors that were very important for him. In the first, um, I'm sorry, this is me being a very bad panelist, uh, not turning off everything I should have. Um, sorry. Okay, so. Um, and that's Cyprian Kamil Norwid, a Polish romantic slash um, modernist poet. I mean, he could be compared to Charles Baudelaire. So if you want to have him on a broader literary map, so have him with Baudelaire more than with, I don't know, Lord Byron. Um, and Norwid is the central um, theme as a, a, a persona that uh, Suskover devoted the longest poema in his uh, first uh, poetry book too. So, and that's something Justin also wrote about with Marta Figlerovich, a long and a very detailed analysis of, of the role of Norvit in, in Sutskever's poetry. So maybe you can jump in whenever you feel like. Um, and Norvit is, uh, is a very different poet when it comes to poetics. He's experimenting with the language. He's using neologies and something that Sutskever does a lot. He's also, he has this also idea of a poetic work, I mean, of a work of a poet as a, as a craftsman, meaning that carving the word, changing the word, and through the word, um, showing what it cannot be shown otherwise, what cannot be, uh, what is invisible otherwise. And this is 
something that can be close to uh, to Sutkever's notion of, of uh, Ars Poetica. Um, he was also the first in Polish uh, modern literature to experiment uh, with modernist prose and uh, uh, poetry prose. So, so the poem on, on verse. So something that's why also Baudelarian uh, uh, associations are proper here. But he is a very different poet because uh, Norwich's poetry is a poetry that is very disciplined. It doesn't mean that Suskover's poetry is not. His neoclassical uh, uh, po uh, um, poems are clearly very disciplined. And uh, Suskover would say that if you don't have, I mean, you need a form to express something. So without the form, there is no, uh, uh, you cannot form the word. I mean, you cannot express the word. Uh, but it's a very different poetics. Mm. And that, but something there is, I mean, something with Norvid is, and with his uh, uh, prose, poetic prose is important here. This is a poetics of epiphany. And I think that this is a very important um, 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 angle to look at, at, pro, at Sutskever's uh, prose as well. So this poetics of epiphany and the, uh, the way of understanding of the power of the poetic word. So and, maybe we'll maybe we'll come back to that in a second because I want to circle back and give Zachary a chance to to sort of reflect on what you said about genre and yeah, that, that our, was... our inability to sort of maybe maybe we don't have the words. So you've used you know that we we've used the words uh, prose poetry. I know um, that when Zachary's volume was about to come out and you know we had very friendly conversations about it and I saw that the title was Essential Prose. I had a question about that. I think I even wrote to the book center and, and, and said, I, I don't, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll do what you want. And I, and I suggested essential fictions because fictions, I don't know, it, it seemed less prosaic, frankly. Yeah. Uh, but, but when we think of the prose here, it's experimental, but it's not experimental in the way that we might think of postmodern prose, right? I mean, there's still, there's still the use of grammar. There's still the use of paragraphs. Um, he's doing something quite different uh, than perhaps we might be used to in, in a different form of more contemporary experimentation. So maybe Zachary, you can pick up on some of those points that Catalina made and then we'll circle back to Epiphany. Yeah, I mean, I, I take it, you know, my, my view of the genre and nature of these prose poetry, I think it's a little bit less, it's, it's, it's um, perhaps a little bit more categorical than Carolina's, but I think what, what she said was, is very illuminating. And it makes me think of the fact that many of these, of these pieces in, in, um, in, this, in the translated book and, and his prose poetry in general include lyric poetry within them, right? So there's, mm -hmm. there's as, as Caroline was saying, the network of text, right? Thinking about um, the smile at the end of the world in my translation, which includes, um, uh, you know, which which includes poetry within it, or um, the, the happiest, which includes um, aphorisms. So these are, and it's unclear. You know, so Sutzker himself called them a different name, right? Initially calling them prose of Bashrabu, um, and I think they do retain much narrative form, right? There are, even though um, there are, it would be you know incorrect to call them short stories. And many of them have recognizable narrative uh, arcs within them, um, and and there's there are characters that recur, not exactly the same characters, but types of characters that recur throughout these pieces. So although they're they're different from more the the memoir pieces that Sutskever has written, they're different from the works, for example, in Bamlane and Penema. Uh, they do have something of a of a narrative um, character to them. Um, uh, and so I think they, they do sit in, at, at, the, at an inter intersection and maybe we don't have the right, the right words for it. And, and it, it, it also strikes me, uh, and please both, both of you jump in when you, when you can, that these, these fictions are not plot driven as much as they are um, encounter driven. That is the, the, what is going on is a series of encounters, uh, encounters with the dead who are very much alive 
with survivors, with friends from childhood? Uh, are they imagined? Are they real? With casual acquaintances from a world that doesn't exist, with unexpected memories that sort of come uh, at, at a moment's notice. And uh, in several of these, and I'm not the only one who's noticed these, um, the narrator is also the person telling someone else's tale. So he is both the receiver of someone else's narrative and then the person who repackages it and, and tells it. Um, and in a way, I wonder whether this was also part of a broader project on the part of Sutzkever in terms of his own self mythologizing. That is the, 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 the that, that he was sort of the, the center of this nexus of memories and survivors and that they would sort of come to him and he would then uh, figure out how to repackage that and then to radiate it back out into the world uh, in different form so that it would have some lasting um, power. I, I, I'm, I'm, sh I'm struck by your ending, uh, one, of the, one of the lines in, in Kira Carolina, uh, Carolina that you write about, um, Zachary, you translate the following, the past got lost tomorrow. I mean, I just love that, that line. The past got lost tomorrow. Let's hear what it has to tell us. Years fly faster than days, but they wait for a bit at the edge of an abyss to let me throw my lasso over them and retrieve them before it's too late. And they splinter along with my glance. My flying lasso doesn't let them fall. Outliving the living is my painful joy. I mean, this I mean, is I amazing. I think. Yeah, there's, there's so much to be said about the, the monologue as a genre, and, and these are not simple monologues, right? But there, I think there is perhaps a point of comparison with other writers who used um, the, the monologue of witness, right? Uh, whether it was Chavis or, or it's uh, and I But I think you're right that Sutzkever has a spin on it where he, he, con he constructs himself as the nexus, as the recipient of these monologues and, and puts them out there into the, the sphere of memory, so to speak. Carolina? Yeah, um, I mean, on one hand, it's just, I mean, encounter driven and also the settings for many stories is a cafe and it's a moment and the, these are this really uh, modernist <laughs> ephemeral moments. And actually this brings me back to my idea of poetics of epiphany, the modernist poetics of epiphany that is found in the, in the everyday and out of, I mean, and these everyday encounters, the, the smoke in a cafeteria mm -hmm. uh, can bring back something or, um, but it's not just, bring, it's not about bringing the past back to the present. It's his doing, and this was observed also by Ruth Wise and other scholars. I mean, he's doing something very strange at the time. This quote you brought was, was great. I mean, this is a kapoyerdike zeit. I mean, that's a really like a topsy-turvy mm -hmm. time, something that is going on there. I mean, and uh, as, as soon as you, you think you understand something, and that's also almost a direct quote, you, you lose the thread of this. So it's, it's he's playing with us. And, uh, and, I think, and you're very much right that this, this also, I mean, uh, has to do with the role Sutkever played in Israel. But also, I mean, these stories on the other hand, they are also biographical. So the encounter is also with the self or with different versions of the self. And hence the, 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 the role of the mirrors or different uh, window panes that appear in the stories. The twin or brother. Twin brothers, yes, or, or other, you know, yet another eye uh, or in, you know, a hand that has these eyes. And um, uh, so these motives of, 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 uh, 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 of a doppelganger or, or even the other, I mean, this comes from a poem, like a third hand that is writing. I mean, it's not his hand, but it's assimilated somehow into his body uh, are very important. So these are different and yeah. So I, I'm, I totally agree that these are encounter driven, but also ephemeral, I mean, something ephemeral drives I think, it. I think they're also milieu driven, right? Many of them begin not with an encounter and not with, you know, again, I, I find myself my reference is being very provincial compared to Carolina's, but you know, it, it, putting the, you know, comparing these to perhaps a modern day short story, right? It is not these not begin with a conflict or or a plot point or or a character or or a character exp exploration. They begin with a milieu, right? So there's the there's the natural milieu, right? So often in, in these in many of these miniatures, we're looking at a uh, a narrative uh, depiction 
of a natural development or a natural transformation, maybe a natural epiphany to use Carolina's terms, right? Or we're, or we're, we're looking at um, a, a moment of, of flight from oppression or from, or for, or from, from, from murderers. So it's, it's not um, just encounter between two people, but, but often um, a milieu um, and a natural development. And, and also he, he disrupts uh, whenever, because that's what Zachary mentioned, sometimes there is something of a plot and it, like a con more conventional prosaic development. And then Suskever suddenly disrupts it with it. There, there are these turns and they are linguistic turns as well. Something happens to the language and he starts using it in a very different, uh, I mean, uncanny way, maybe this is the, the word. So we have, we're moving between the, something that is known the everyday or the, the past even, and it becomes suddenly uncanny. And that's how Sutskever's language uh, works and his metaphors, because mm -hmm. what happens in these stories, and this is something I guess, uh, usually readers do not expect from the so-called um, Holocaust prose. Uh, we still can debate this, uh, uh, this description, uh, is the poetics of excess, because Sutskever, when I was thinking and trying to find the right word, and I thought excess uh, is the right word. First of all, he's really, I mean, this, his language is full with metaphors and full with whole metaphorical constellations and, and images and unexpected somehow. We saw it with the first uh, story, first piece <laughs> that, uh, that Zachary uh, uh, read. And then excess, uh, uh, so it's going beyond, beyond the limits and challenging these limits, also challenging the reader's expectation and challenging the language uh, and the conventions of representation, which I think what is happening uh, in his uh, works and going beyond the bounds of the self as well. And uh, of the, sometimes of the reason, I mean, the, the role of the fantastic here in the role of different, um, um, let's say, uh, fantastic narratives that that uh, that also somehow animate these stories is very, uh, very important. And then the very notion of the beyond that right. speaks to Suskever, that Suskever is communicating with. Uh, that's why I thought that the excess here is something that helps us capture many right. uh, features of, of his work. I want to tell us a, a very brief anecdote relating to the, ex the excess or the boundary crossing nature. In Green Aquarium, there's an image here of the, the green, uh, the green kite from the uh, Platz de Gaulle from the Burst Gallbladder. And when I translated that, the editors from the book center, who were very acute readers, uh, said, "Is this what he said?" <laughs> so they, they 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 wondered if I was exaggerating the 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 um, the, 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 met, the image in my translation. I said, "Yes, that's what he said." <laughs> so. So, right, it, it is uh, expectation subverting um, imagery. You've offered us such a wonderful way of reading Zachary's translation, Carolina, because this idea of access also requires the reader, even the reader, you know, who's used to reading Sutskever, it demands that they slow down, that they unlearn how, they've, how they approach prose. And I found that having all of these stories in one volume was in a way overwhelming. I couldn't read it all at once. You can't just sit down you know, at night and read 25 stories because there's so much in each of them. They almost demand to be read one by one with a lot of time in between them in order to allow them to work their way through you and to sort of do, do what they need to do rather than reading them as we might read other prose, you know, chapter by chapter or a volume of short stories. Uh, in terms of the, the, and this is part of the challenge of, of sort of figuring out what he's doing because over time, people have compared him to anything that seems uh, resident. So, oh, Sutzkover is the Yiddish Bruno Schultz or Sutzkover was uh, uh, influenced by Latin American magic realism, right? So you have all of these ways of, and of course, there, there could be comparisons with any writer could be compared to any other writer uh, at some point. But we, I think that, that one of the things that we might want to come back to is uh, Zachary's question of uh, how this fits in to the broader genre of Horben Literatur, of Holocaust literature. What does it add to Holocaust literature? 
that we don't yet have in some ways. And then the, the alternative question to that would be to come back to, to something that Miriam, I'm sure, would have addressed. And that is Sutzkever as a Yiddish writer in Israel and how so many of these stories um, are not only published in Israel, but in many ways take place at the cafe that he used to, or, or imagined to have taken place at the cafe that he used to go and write in, in Yafo and in Jaffa. So this question of Sutzkever and how he relates to other perhaps Yiddish writers in Israel. We, we see Yossel Bergner and writing sort of in, in, a, in a fantastic type, type of way. Then we have a, a much different form in Avram Karpinovich, who also writes about his memories of Vilna as Sutzkever is doing, but in a completely different way. So perhaps we could talk just a little bit about how he adds to these two different bodies, libraries of literature that are occurring and growing simultaneously. Sorry about that. So, so I, I, would, I would say two things. One is, um, as far as Chorvin literature, as far as Holocaust literature, you know, let's bracket um, whether, you know, how useful a description is of these, of these works. But I would say what attracted me or what interests me, and, and, and you and Caroline can speak to how good, how accurate and impression this is. One thing that sets them apart is their lack of explicit historical placement. Um, you know, we know from the what writer's history and from the fact that these are autobiographical, that these are Holocaust pieces, but there is very little, um, there's some geographic detail, which in some of the of the pieces places it in Vilna or, or in the Vilna Umgegend. But in the pieces that are perhaps that are about tragedy, they're about um, people seeking to murder him, about uh, ghetto, um, there is little in the way of historical detail. And so I find that some of these pieces are best described as liminal or as in, in, in this the space between the living and dead and not in a historical Holocaust um, that, that in, in, his, in, in, um, in temporal space. The, the second point I would like to make is I think these pieces have to be understood in the context of the Golden Cape and I haven't fully worked this thought out yet, but um, the, you know, many of them a, a, a appeared there in the first time. And the Golden Arcade is itself a space where poetry and prose were mixed. Poetry and prose and memoir were mixed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, understanding these as a, as a history building and memoir building um, endeavor uh, in, as part of a global Yiddish culture centered in, in Israel, obviously, um, but also transnational in certain ways. Okay, I mean, the last point you mentioned, I, I was just thinking about by Mleyan and Pinmer, yeah. which is actually stories, uh, uh, memoirs, and uh, essays. So the, the, this mixes the, the genres you, you mentioned in one volume. Um, um, but perhaps I would like to raise another point, though I would, I'm very curious why you haven't chosen to, to translate something from this very last thing, just out of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, Yossel Birstein, for example. So what they share is this talent for telling stories. Many of these stories have this kind of, we talked about the situation of enc encounter, for example. So talking to people like in a cafe, uh, uh, a milieu, or like their uh, friends, you, you tell the story to, and sometimes it's a better story if we remember, oh, I have to right now look at the uh, the English, the current English title of the story, I'm sorry. Um, a portrait with a blue sweater where we have this story he tells and then in the, in the, in the very, I'm sorry for the spoilers, uh, <laughs> The, the end of the story, he, he tells us that he told the story to Mark Chagall, his uh, friend, his real friend. I mean, so that's how he's also mixing the, the autobiographical experience and the facts uh, that Zachary mentioned with fiction. Um, and he, this story is a very autobiographical story with some places in Warsaw, Grosser Library, this and that, and his personal experience in visiting Warsaw, which I perhaps will be able to mention so in, at some point. And he said, perhaps it was a better story when I was telling it. <laughs> that the story that was is now now written. So this oral, I mean, this this drive to tell stories. This is something that uh, that that, that Cover has a talent for, and I, I love Birstein for the same thing. But and they also share this poetics of the everyday. But with Birstein, there is no epiphany. There is not. So there is, and there is no. 
uh, this metapoetical refle reflection that is embedded in Sutskever's works. And uh, when he start, it's very characteristic when he's starting to write his prose in the first, I mean, it's Kurzabarschreibungen, so short descriptions. So the green aquarium, the greener aquarium. So it opens actually with a, I don't know, like a discussion of the different types of of of, of words of of, and uh, so th that's something that is very peculiar and 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 very quotable things like walk through the words like you would walk through a minefield. So uh, and then what is uh, and it's very interesting because he starts like this: your teeth are bars of bone, behind them in a crystal cell lie your enchained words. And of course, we have this uh, this prison of words that you not then have to set free or not or, or be beware of. Uh, but what is characteristic here? It's Geschmitte Werte, which uh, I looked at all tr uh, English translation, and all of the translations uh, that chose enchained. Uh, then I think change is the harsh house uh, choice, and shackled is root wise choice. But Geschmitte is also for forged. Right, forged. Uh, forged. Car. Right. Which this double meaning? I mean, this double meaning is there. It's Schmieden in Caton, and so uh, put in irons in in Schmieden as forging. So so you're also these words are forged, nice. trapped. And uh, I was I don't I have no idea how 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 to have uh, how to render it in English. Perhaps impossible. Very easy in Polish. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, 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 while, you're, while you're on that, though, but but maybe you could yeah. talk a little bit. Of, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll just uh, just finish about this. So this this is very incredible. So he's when he's uh, starting this uh, adventure of writing prose. Let's call it like this. He's starting opening with this metapoetical reflection, and then these reflections also about uh, uh, words drunk on other worldly poppy blossoms. It comes back in other stories, even not from the same collection. So you see how they this thread develops. But okay, while I'm on that, I can come back to Poland, perhaps. Please. <laughs> so I just have one more thing to say, and that's something we discussed, and I and Zachary also wanted me to bring it. So there is a. I was thinking, and another idea came to my mind when I was preparing for this uh, discussion. That there are two more poets that uh, that are very important for Sutskever, and one is Tuvim, and Tuvim also appears in the in the in the in the stories uh, and in the story I just uh, mentioned with the blue sweater. Uh, he meets a girl, and uh, she reads Tuvim. It means she's. Uh, I mean, these are this is the image, this very stereotypical image of Jewish girls reading Tuvim. On the other hand, there were Jewish many Jewish girls reading Tuvim. Julian Tuvim, a Polish uh, poet, a master of the Polish word, a, a Jewish poet uh, who transformed profoundly the Polish poetic language, who is sharing many things with uh, Sutskever. And when Sutskever came to Warsaw in 1935, he visited a cafe, yet another encounter, now we're in real time, uh, and he read his poems to Tuvim. Tuvim did not know Yiddish, though he was thinking about uh, working with another poet who knew Yiddish to publish an anthology of Yiddish poetry, while at the same time writing very terrible things about Yiddish as a jargon in something that should be dropped. So Tuvim is a, a, is a complicated figure, but he was like, uh, uh, for many Jewish poets also writing in Yiddish, he was this figure to challenge uh, or to uh, emulate depending. So he, Sutskever, here, here's the young Sutskever coming to, uh, uh, to Warsaw and Tuvim tells him, so he reads one poem and Tuvim then tells him, continue, do you have more? And then he was, when he was asked by, I think it was Ehrenborg, do you know any good Yiddish poets? So yeah, of course, of course. I mean, it's Sutskever, you know. And, and um, so this is Tuvim and today, I just, when I was reading uh, the Green Aquarium, uh, I thought Tuvim was the one that there's this, I, I don't know, like a strange, uh, moment where he's writing about green, green this and green that, that's, Tuvim has a whole thing about greenness. Oh, yeah? and I thought, cool. perhaps, I mean, it's not an influence, it's rather something, a shared poetical experience that I want to uh, uh, avoid any influences because this is not what Sutskever is about. But it came to me that there's more Tuvim perhaps than I was willing to admit, uh, admit earlier on, because what I am 
firmly convinced of is that uh, Bolesław Leszmian, yet another Polish poet who profoundly transformed uh, uh, the language, a uh, Jewish poet, but he was baptized. Um, that something that Sutskever writes about, he was Sutskever's poet. And he, Sutskever, and let me read from this collection, Heather Valencia's translation. I want to tell you about a poet who wrote about the same issue in an extraordinary way. This, is, uh, this poet is of Jewish origin. His name is Bolesław Leśmian. He was born in Zamość, Zamisz, the same town as Perez. I believe he was not born as a Jew, although he had Jewish parents. He is one of the greatest Polish poets. I knew him, I saw him in Warsaw in 1936. He was a small man who worked as a pharmacist. He was a notary, but not important. If you looked at him, you would never have imagined that he was one of the greatest poets in Poland or perhaps in the world. And that's very strong. Uh, so uh, Leshman is almost unknown because he's very hard to translate the things he does to the language and the role of language he ascribes to the language and to Ars Poetica. Uh, I think they share the same poetic worldview. And then Sutkever uh, quotes from his uh, tractate on poetry. And he says, I would like to tell you uh, about some extracts from this text to read them to you because they sound like a prophecy. Um, and he's quoting Leshman. Nietzsche writes this aphorism in one of his works. Whatever one says about woman is true. We can alter this sentence and turn it around. Whatever one says about poetry will not be true. Poetry resists any definition. A definition is for, for poetry a kind of a glass coffin, which kills with its transparency. So I hope that we are not doing this to Sutskever, trying to define <laughs> this, uh, uh, po po prose. <laughs> No, that, 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 that's just wonderful. And, and to come back just to, first of all, thank you for elegantly uh, correcting my mistake, Joshua Bierstein, not Joshua Bergner. Um, and uh, the issue of the translation of the memoirs, um, there's a difference that I hope I'll be able to talk to in October between his memoiristic writing and these fictions that Zachary has translated. Uh, it's interesting that um, the way you describe, you both describe his fictions that appear in this volume, as ethereal, as epiphanies, as excess, are the exact opposite of what he does in the prose memoir that he chooses never to come back to. He never republishes it. He never, he barely mentions it. Um, he doesn't reflect on it in his collected works. It's sort of almost um, forgotten. So he clearly has um, an affection for this type of writing that he's doing here, but draws a line between a different type of prose writing that he did at a, at a specific period in his life, mainly in Moscow and in the, in the period after that. In terms of the Ehrenborg piece that you um, referred to, the Ehrenborg uh, memoir that appears in Beim Lane and Penemer and was also in the Golden Cape before that will appear in the volume on the oh, Golden Ghetto. Nice. nice. And, will, and as will uh, his piece on Peretz Markish and on Shloyme Michols. So, so I wanna, really I, I, can, I, can I mention Ehrenborg and to, 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 to reflect off Carolina's Please. quoting the Tuvium story. You both know, but I just want to mention it that the uh, Aaron, the his interaction with Ehrenberg and by Mlane and Penimer, right, uh, recounts this, is is um, reminiscent of his encounter with with Tuvim in that he reads something that Ehrenberg doesn't understand um, semantically, but does understand emotionally and phonetically through the words. So I think that's the fact that is is decades of his life were bookended by that encounter with Tuvim and the encounter with Ehrenberg. Of course represented both by Sutzgeber, so not maybe not historically, but uh, self-interestedly is a great way to represent his poetry as something non-comprehensible, but, but comprehensible. Right. So we have about 10 minutes left, I see, and we promise to allow uh, some questions from the Q&A. So Alex is going to rejoin us and uh, hopefully Zachary and Catalina will be able to continue to say what they had wanted to say via the questions. <laughs> Um, before yes. we jump into the question, just a quick note that for those that are curious to read this book, I just dropped into the chat the link to purchase it. So um, definitely everyone's going to want to have their own copy, um, especially after this talk today. Okay, on to the questions. Um, Paul Goldberg asks, why is it important to finally define the genre? How does it add to the meaning or understanding of the words or what the author meant to convey? Um. I guess my, my, my brief answer is it really adds to our appreciation of 
the text, the creation of the text and the author's intention in creating the text to understand the kinds of writers that Sutskever liked to read and the kinds of writers that his writing makes, that makes us think of, which Carolina so um, elegantly and eruditely described to us. So, um, you know, when one says prose poetry in English, one thinks of a certain genre, or set of genres or set of literary infrastructures. But when one thinks about um, uh, different sorts of names for the genre or gender crossing or, or gender transgressing or gender or genre transgressing fictions, one has such a broader universe of potential um, descriptors to draw upon. Yeah, I would second that and just add to this that this helps us appreciate the revolution that Suskever brings with his uh, writing simply. So there is a point of departure and a certain background, and then we can appreciate what Sutskever does to, to, to the literary language itself. And I think that's, that, that helps us appreciate his uh, mastery. I have my own question I'd like to insert here um, relevant to this question, which is, um, Zachary, um, you mentioned the idea of Sutskever as a prophetic poet. Um, at the beginning. And I think um, there's a lot of, there's uh, something really there. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that and perhaps um, related to this question of genre, because in, you know, the, the prophetic works of Tanakh, genre is, is very much mixed. I wonder if, do you think that he's a prophetic poet in that way too, or is this more just uh, something else? That's a great question. You know, I, I... I, I have ambitions to translate his much of his lyric poetry as well. And, and but going back to Sibir and Valdix, right? Some of his earliest works, he considered himself as engaged in a world building project through poetry, like very explicitly. And and there's a lot that, that's shared there with with Kulbach and Markish and a certain genre of youth, right, in that time. But I think the Sutskeverian flair is perhaps less society building and more natural world building. Which I think can be seen here in these in these works, where, um, where in the, even in the short piece I read at the beginning of this of this session, ice flows are breaking, um, but it's the ice flows are breaking to present to us a wedding and a creation of a world. So yes, I, I, whether that's Tanakhic, I, I would I would hesitate, right? But um, it's definitely youthful and pro prophetic and and, and neo romantic. Um. Yeah, I just think that the source of revelation and source of prophecy is somewhere else. And the very title, The Prophecy of the Inner Eye, tells us this. And it's worth also to read the story and what the prophetic mode here does and how it helps to uh, somehow to sometimes to survive or others to survive or do other things. And it is this moment where my, the voice is mine, but at the same time, it comes from somewhere distant. But I... Um, but it's a different, I mean, a different conception, uh, a concept of, uh, of transcendence and metaphysics. Uh, so so there's a, there seems to be a few other questions that I'm picking up on. I'll try to put them together. Josh uh, Steinfeld asks, the other side of excess. So this is going off uh, of something that Carolina uh, asked, uh, mentioned. The other side of excess is perhaps loss or excess as loss uh, and suggests that Sutskever's funeral in the morning uh, a concert in the evening. Maybe, um, can you comment a little bit more on, on your insight regarding excess? And not on... Me or Zucker? I mean, I, I guess I brought the excess. I think it's a great point. I mean, also uh, excess in a different, uh, I mean, as an answer to loss or as a um, representation of the experience of loss. So I think, yeah. Uh, I think it's a great point. And I mean, the two work, I mean, I, I don't think they, they contradict each other actually, or perhaps actually Sutskever is a poet of contradictions. I mean, so in the, so the normal logic here does not apply. So these contradictions can be accommodated within one poetic worldview and as poetica as such. Mm. Zachary, do you have more on that just by virtue of translating? Did you find, did you find sometimes the metaphor upon metaphor the neologism, the breaking up of um, normal way of writing prose, the the musicality. Did you find that excessive in some ways as a yeah, so, uh, challenging, well, exhausting? And 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 I think the difference between translating this genre, whatever it is, and lyric poetry is that at least much of Sitzker's poetry has structure 
to confine one's possibilities. Whereas uh, translating a sentence or a paragraph, you can, you can pursue different alternatives. And it's a little um, overwhelming to try to rein yourself in and figure out how to convey accurately while conveying um, uh, rhetorically and evocatively. Mm. Yeah, I, I have to tell because I also translated Suskiver into Polish. I first, I mean, my first Yiddish teacher, Michal Friedman, he was translating uh, Suskiver's prose uh, while Suskiver was still alive. So they were talking on the phone and Suskiver was checking. Uh, that's what uh, Michal Friedman told me. And I took over later on uh, after my teacher's death. And I have to tell you that on a tiny little prose thing from Bamleyan and Pennemer, I spent, I think, weeks really not to have it because it's very easy to, to slide into kitsch. Right, oh yes. And Suskiver is not kitschy. Right. So right. that's the challenge for the translator, I think, to work with this excessive language and not to, 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 to turn it into something kitschy because this is something that Suskiver is certainly not. Yeah, that's well said. Yep. Great. Um, There's a question here about um, influence. And I know, Carolina, you were you're loath to use the term influence. Um, but nevertheless, uh, someone asks, I'm curious about what writers or works that Skiver was reading and engaging with while he was writing his later stories in the 70s and 80s. Are there any prominent influences in these writings um, that are different from the early writings? Um, I, I will say briefly that among the works he was definitely engaging with, right, were, were the works he was editing for the Golden Cape. Um, so, so, um, so that's the spectrum of, of world Yiddish writing then, which although constrained and, 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 and um, decreasing was still uh, quite capacious. Um, you know, I'll leave Carolina to talk about other world literatures that he might've been reading at the time, but that's what comes to mind. Um, so, I mean, then something, actually I was curious to hear from Zachary, I mean, other like perhaps not influences, but intertext that you were had in mind, for example, the, you know, the fantastic tale uh, and Edgar Allan Poe, uh, for example, the Sutskever mentions actually. Um, uh, but um, I was thinking also about the Israeli context uh, Justin uh, brought uh, quickly and also the way of introducing the, Israel, the, the Holocaust narratives into uh, Israeli Hebrew, also prose mainstream through these uh, stories sometimes through the voice of the child. And I had somehow today, I had in mind uh, David Grossman's mommy, mm -hmm. uh, um, which has which has this, I mean, part of the Sea Under Love, uh, which has this, it's a different writer, but it's it's also an excessive writer. When you brought uh, Schultz, I had thought, thought, okay, Grossman, we can mention Grossman here, but also like the way of if working with the, with the Holocaust motifs through the fantastic stories, through, uh, the narrative of, of another voice, I thought this, this, this is, uh, there is a broader context uh, uh, that this, the stories from the 70s fit and 80s and fit into. So I see that it's, uh, it's one o'clock now, right? Did I, no, did, did, I, did I freeze there for a moment? No, no, you were good. No. I did. So, so uh, I, see, I see that it's one o'clock now and uh, I've uh, two o'clock actually. I've learned uh, so much during this discussion of this wonderful book. I want to encourage everyone out there listening to um, not slowly go and buy it, but run uh, as quickly as you can to your computer to order it. And I also want to go back to what uh, Alex was saying at the beginning, a shout out to all of those interested in learning Yiddish, that uh, it's one thing to read a writer like Sutskever in translation, it's another uh, to read him uh, in the original. And uh, there are many opportunities this coming summer to do so. Yivo's Uriel Weinreich summer program is all online. Uh, the Naomi Prava Kadar program in Tel Aviv will be offering in-person and online courses. The International Summer Seminar in Yiddish Language and Culture in Warsaw is offering Yiddish classes. The 10th summer program for Yiddish Language and Literature in Paris is offering that. So uh, to quote uh, a different, uh, let's say Jewish personality, if not now, when? Uh, now is your opportunity to learn and to be able to become your own translator of Sutzkeber. So with that, I really want to thank Ivo, the Yiddish Book Center, Zachary uh, and Catalina for uh, what was 
an amazingly stimulating hour talking about Sutzkaber in this new volume. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure to be in New York and to in Yivo, almost like in Vilna. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Thank you all so much. And Justin, uh, a special thank you to moderating. So we're really grateful to have you all here today. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you.